So we start with the highest upvoted uh, question and to say how can or if uh, can the people in affluent countries like the Netherlands be satisfied with consuming much less? It's a very good question and one that we have been asking since the sort of World War II consumer boom. Um, I mean really what I find very interesting is that we're sort of quite embarrassed to think about sort of psychology and talking about these issues from a sort of psychoanalytical perspective <clears throat> but there's a lot to be said from asking ourselves some serious questions about what consumption is for and what products are for etc and we know we know all about this we have the psychology of consumption very very clear <clears throat> and the issue i think isn't so much that we're not capable of questioning sort of our own consumption as citizens it's more about the kind of political will in the public discourse around these issues that actually there is still a little bit of sort of um, <clears throat> fringe if you like or <clears throat> counterculture assumptions around wanting to live a bit differently and this is changing a bit in terms of sort of more sort of mainstreaming but as we've seen mainstreaming has its problems in and of itself so in many ways it's happening it's happening slowly but what really interests me is for whom is it happening? So for example, say here in Wales, we have a lot of shops that are emerging around not having packaging, etc., and things like that. But of course, they tend to be frequented by people of higher socioeconomic status, etc. So the problematic isn't that we can't do it, it's how we're doing it. And and sort of putting forward those ideas that actually it's consumption that leads the way to social change is really the fundamental problematic that I've been trying to think about for the last 20 years. So that's a very long winded way of saying it's complicated. We have the capacity of citizens, I believe it, but I think the status quo of one product at a time and one bit of lifestyle at a time is, is problematic in the sense that it's too piecemeal approach to thinking about degrowth as a collective project. I'll stop there, that was a very long answer, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another question that actually our panel have chosen. And this question by Jesse Doman. Uh, and says, what do you think about the argument that sharing economy actually is anti-degrowth in the sense that it replaces social relationships like hitchhiking with an economic relation like Uber, uh, which degrades the relationship? Kirsty. <laughs> Yeah, and there's some really good papers about that out there already, actually, people making that very much that argument that um, it is, whereas you can start with something, say, like Airbnb, and I saw a comment that that's not a sharing economy, it's a platform economy, and I, and I take what you mean by that. I was using it as an example because Ellen MacArthur hold it up as an example of the sharing economy, and that's what is problematic. But any, anyway, sort of coming back to that, um, this idea that it does displace Sort of social capital and kind of innate social relationships is massively problematic for the sharing economy uh, but i think it's often about the lenses we bring to these questions so if you look at sort of airbnb or whomever through a kind of sort of pseudo or post or neo-marxist lens you get one picture if you look at it from a sort of a different perspective you get another picture so if you look at it from the experiences of people who've got to stay in somebody's house in japan and it was amazing you can say there's some great stuff that comes out of that so there's no uh, that's the kind of challenge and the joy of being a social scientist there's no one story to be told about how these different platforms are experienced what we have to think about really when it comes to sort of issues of degrowth is about the impacts what are the actual impacts in terms of environment um, and social impacts as well and certainly there's some interesting research that shows that what we're seeing with things like airbnb is people taking more holidays because now the accommodation is cheaper so it comes again back to the fact that what it could be doing is adding another layer of consumption on top of existing consumption practices and that's something that the circular economy is like a mainstream, mainstream discourse doesn't really engage with that much. And that's massively problematic. Okay, thank you. And maybe the last one in the view of time, uh, there's a question again chosen for me. Uh, and the question is uh, somebody, I have not seen the name, wonders if upscaling of sustainable activity is in the end the same as growth. What we've seen would suggest that, wouldn't it really? Um, in terms, again, 
those comments I made in the talk about, um, well, I've already made that point, haven't I, in terms of like a secondary market on top of the primary instead of displacing the markets would suggest that. And it certainly seems uh, in terms of creating products that we buy with less packaging, um, that can be recycled, etc. You know, recycling in and of itself isn't automatically an environmental good if what it then does is create some moral license within us that we can just keep buying things that because it goes into the recycling bin. I mean, I've heard within my own research and other people's research, people saying, well, I don't worry about single-use plastics because it gets recycled, right? I mean, that's a very banal example, but it's not um, an unuseful example to illustrate a bigger point about how sort of putting these mechanisms in place actually does something to us psychologically that we think therefore everything is being taken care of somewhere else. So yes, absolutely, I, I, I think that is the case. And I suppose what if I if anyone goes away with a message from me today, it's a plea for more social science research, like get involved, you know, get in touch if you're interested in this stuff. Let's do more of this research and actually answer these questions about actually what are the social costs, the what's the consumption work that goes into these kind of practices. And I think that needs to be evidenced more to kind of really think about rejigging some of the different policies that are being put forward. Thank you very much, Kirsty. Uh, in the of time, we have to stop the questions here, but uh, please join us again at the end of the second part and we will have more questions uh, coming to you. We have also more time to digest the questions. I also want to thank all the viewers uh, uh, for all the questions that come also upvoting. It's pretty lively discussion. We are trying to really catch up, but it's also a pretty compact program. So I have to move on to the second talk. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsty, for your talk and also for answering all these questions. No worries.